Uh, first, I am Michael Southern. I'm uh, a, uh, architectural historian and GIS coordinator with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, in Raleigh. And uh, I'm, uh, accompanying me is uh, Andrew Edmonds. He's a GIS uh, technical analyst uh, for the State Historic Preservation Office and the real brains behind our uh, GIS system we'll be demonstrating today. And Joseph Hooper from uh, University of North Carolina, who will have to tell a little bit more about himself. When uh, uh, I'm uh, going to be starting with uh, demonstrating a uh, dedicated Rosenwald uh, uh, web map site that we that Andy and I have developed at the State Historic Preservation Office. It's something you wouldn't be able to do at home, at home on your desktop. It's really an industrial grade uh, GIS system. It's a subset of what we developed for the entire uh, North Carolina Historic Property Survey, which includes about 85,000 uh, sites uh, that are mapped in GIS. Uh, and it uh, requires expensive software and servers and these kinds of things. It's not the kind of thing you'll do at home, but if you or your organization has an affiliation with uh, a state historic preservation office in your state or with a university or other institution uh, that has these resources, perhaps you can kind of tag into that uh, and develop something similar. Andy will be talking about uh, uh, more accessible and free online uh, uh, ways to uh, uh, do some uh, web mapping. And uh, Joseph will be using, showing us some other kind of analytical tools uh, using uh, a geospatial uh, uh, type information uh, and using the, uh, uh, the database. Um, the um, GIS stands for Geographic Information System, and it's basically, in principle, it uh, is based on the idea of layering data that can come from many different uh, sources that is that can be that are geographically coded so you can see them and their actual relation to each other on the ground. For the system we're demonstrating, the, the data we created is really just nothing but the points for the Rosenwald schools we're going to see that we've mapped. And uh, we use other data that's called a vector data. Other vector data is things created like the state DOT or the state highway system, uh, county boundaries, these kinds of things that we can draw into what we do. And another uh, type of data, uh, which we'll see a lot of uh, today, is called raster data, and that's essentially uh, pictures. And that's usually things like aerial photography uh, or maps, uh, and particularly historic maps, is something we're, we'll be taking a look at today that's of great interest to us. Uh, with GIS, you can do a number of different things. You can see the big picture of the distribution, in our case, Rosenwald schools, uh, but whatever type of uh, resource or feature you're mapping. Um, and we'll be looking at schools that still exist and those that no longer exist that we've been able to map. Uh, you can search and zoom specific schools by name or type or the, uh, county they're in. You can uh, look at them in high resolution aerial views or in street view and bird's eye and actually kind of walk around them. Uh, you can link to the FIS database, uh, to National Register nominations for those that are in the National Register, and, uh, and to photographs which we have uh, pos uh, posted for some but not all of the schools on this site. Uh, and we use historic maps to uh, find the locations of Rosenwald schools that are no longer standing or in some cases find schools that still exist that we didn't uh, know still existed. Um, when you first open this website, it's a public site, and if there's time, we'll demonstrate it, an actual live thing, but I wanted to just do a PowerPoint to show you the basic features. Um, and this is uh, open to the public. We can give you the, uh, the uh, website address. Um, when you first open the site, what you see is a splash screen in greater detail here. This is based on our much bigger uh, statewide historic property survey, and a lot of these links are related to that, but there are tutorials for kind of showing you how to use it, uh, and uh, quick tips down at the bottom as you scroll. But mostly, you would just click on the Agree button, and this opens. And I'll explain what those little dots and colors mean in a minute, but the main features uh, of the screen 
at this level. I want to point your attention to the first to the left. This is a navigation bar, and most of you have used Google Earth or similar type programs, and you, this is what you use to zoom in and out, to pan around the map and that sort of thing. And then we have a toolbar across the top with a number of different options. Uh, you can search to specific schools and zoom to them. Uh, you can search for roads by road number or geographic features, creeks and mountains and whatnot on the map. Uh, there's, there's, you can find addresses if you have, know the street address of a school. You can uh, get down uh, on the map with street view and bird's eye. You can uh, draw and you can annotate the map and you can uh, measure distances and this sort of thing. You can print to a file if you want to use the map for some other purpose, put it in your own PowerPoint, that sort of thing. And there's a map legend. Then on the far right, there are uh, two tabs. One is the data layers, and this is a very simple data layer setup. Uh, one layer is the Rosenwald School themselves. Base data are things like county boundaries, uh, DOT roads and that sort of thing, and then historic maps, which, which we'll look at separately. Uh, there are a number of different background views. Most of them are aerial views from NC1 map from different years, and I'll explain later why uh, we, we show several different years. Uh, the most recent one is the top middle. I mean, is the one you'd use most often. It shows the most recent high-resolution aerial, which is uh, the one at the top middle. There's also street maps. USGS topos, these are various ways you can look at things. Uh, the information itself, uh, uh, we have mapped uh, 279 Rosenwald features, all but three are schools. <coughs> We've identified 130 as no longer standing. There may be uh, others of those that are not marked that way may no longer be standing. Uh, as some of them were first last seen like 20 years ago and that sort of thing. So it's a, an ongoing process updating this. North Carolina had over 800 uh, Rosenwald schools, and this is only a third of them. Uh, most of the others are probably gone, but there are some that probably still exist in some form, and I'll show you how using this, these tools uh, is one way to uh, actually identify some. Uh, the, the color symbology, uh, we use blue for the National Register, the 29 listed in the register are in uh, local districts, 57 on the study list for potential nomination to the National Register, and 10 that are designated, uh, histor locally designated historic landmarks. And this kind of shows the whole distribution. Uh, if, you're, if you first use it, you're not going to know what those colors mean. You just click on the legend and you'll see uh, an explanation for all these uh, all these colors that appear in the map. You can use the tomb, uh, tool to zoom manually to in, into a map for closer views, and as you get to a certain level, uh, the labels pop on for the school names. Uh, so you can uh, browse uh, the map uh, manually in a particular area, but frequently you'll, you'll want to use the search tool, uh, which is a little red arrow in the toolbar. You cl uh, just click that. And in this case, I've entered uh, Russell, the name Russell, for, uh, because I know there's a Russell school out there. And uh, you can also search on school type on um, all the schools within a particular county. Um, and this, uh, uh, you click on the result. There's only one result, the Russell School in Durham County, and zoom to it. And this doesn't show us much. This is on St. Mary's Road. Um, but you can uh, select. Uh, the most recent aerial, and then you can you see a pretty high resolution uh, view of the school uh, from the air and its surroundings. You click on the point for the school itself, and an information window comes up. <coughs> and uh, and then for a National Register school like this, uh, you have multiple options. There's a, a thumbnail photograph, which you can click on and see the full photograph, which you can download for your own use if you want it for a report or if some student's doing a report about Rosenwald schools in his community and that sort of thing. You can click on the uh, link to National Register nomination and open up, for those listed in the National Register, open up the National Register nomination for the school with the description and the history, and uh, you can download that nomination yourself. You can read it online or download it if you'd like to have it uh, on your computer. 
And then I think the coolest thing about this, you can, for every, all, every school uh, on this map, you can click and link to the FISC database entry, see the historic photograph if, if there is one. This is the information that tells you uh, the type of school, one teacher, two teacher, and the funding, uh, the uh, funding year, and this sort of thing. So we have the, the, this, at hand you have these, uh, uh, you can find all this information about a school. You can also click on the street view tool, the little yellow peg man, and click on the road in front of a school. And uh, street view services and bird's eye services do not uh, exist for every road all over the state, but very much of the state, particular urban areas. Uh, Rosenwald schools are frequently in isolated rural areas, and they may not have one or either uh, of the services. But with Street View, depending on how far from the road it is, you can actually get a usable image of a school. Uh, you can also, most of you have probably used Street View, you can actually walk up and down the road around the school um, and kind of see what its local environment is like. With Bird's Eye, you can fl fly down at a low level and. Uh, and in, in some areas actually look at the school from all cardinal points from the air. Um, uh, <coughs> but of course, we can't, don't have all that information uh, for every school. That's a National Register nomination, and, and, and the Bird's Eye and Street View services are not uh, um, everywhere. One thing that interests us is finding the location of schools that no longer exist. The main tools for that or the uh, memories of old people. And that's the resource that we're beginning to lose, of course. Uh, and the other is uh, old maps uh, or other documents that describe locations of schools. Um, and you may have noticed from the statewide map, we have a lot of X's uh, for schools that no longer exist in Edgecombe and in Nash County. Uh, these sites were identified by a team uh, in Edgecombe. It was Rudolph Knight and I think Lawrence Ald. Uh, who I guess worked with informants and other materials around the county to locate virtually every school that ever existed in Edgecombe County. And Hazel Lewis did very similar work in Nash County. And uh, here's an example of a law school that we were able to map. We see on the USGS map, which I don't know the year of that, but there's a little symbol where that red arrow is for school indicating it was there. Here's the aerial view showing the area being re redeveloped. And uh, what you can do with these schools that are long there, you can see what's in the, currently in the area, and you can uh, link to the Fisk University website and see, the, see a picture of the school, so we know that's what the school looked like at that location. Uh, historic maps are of great use. We don't have historic maps scanned and, and posted for every county, and many that we do have are really too old to be of much use for uh, a Rosenwald school study. Um, but we have a number. Those are particularly in the teens and 20s of, of greatest value, but as we'll see, even an older map can be useful also. Uh, here's the, uh, what's, this is really great thing about GIS. You know, you, you geo-reference this historic map and look at it and compare it to modern aerials and that sort of thing. You can kind of see how places have developed. Uh, places that uh, no longer exist. Zooming in to Nash County at one of the schools, we find uh, uh, a label and a symbol for the Rick School uh, uh, at this location. And it's a school that no longer exists. It's, uh, uh, it's X'd out. But uh, we can see what was there uh, by linking to the Fisk University site. And it was located somewhere. We're not precisely probably right on the footprint of that school, but we feel like we're close enough to kind of indicate the location of the school at this intersection. Um, it can be used in other ways. Here's an even older map, 1905, that well predates uh, the Rosenwald program, but uh, useful nonetheless. Here's the school that we uh, thought was gone anyway. We notice in the 1905 map, uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a school there called Colored School Number 3, and there are others all across the county. They're numbered uh, rather than given names. It was, uh, became the location of the Bryan School that really wasn't built until 20 years later. But uh, what this indicates is many Rosenwald schools are erected at locations where there were already African-American schools uh, 
present, and, and, and in every case were great improvements, of course, over the old facility. In this case, I, I called up the aerial. We see this wooded area that uh, uh, where the school was once located, and when the survey team uh, uh, marked this, they indicated it was gone. You can't see it from the road. But zoom in a little bit closer, and you see uh, back in the woods here, obscured, is a familiar looking plan of a two teacher school. And that's uh, exactly what that was. The building may not exist much longer, but it's at least there now, and it des certainly deserves a wintertime visit uh, anyway. Uh, Joseph uh, turned us on to the uh, the, the 1920, what year, 20, uh, Durham, Durham map as an aid to locating schools in Durham. Not every one of them is precisely located, but the, again, we can get kind of close, close enough. Most are gone. The Russell School remains. Um, this is a close-up of the Russell School. Uh, not a close-up. You see in the upper left the blue dot where the Russell School is uh, lo actually located and identified on this map. And another in the lower right is the Sylvan School, uh, which one which we assume was gone, but uh, that's a uh, kind of a closer view of it. And uh, but I looked at the aerial and thought, huh, you know that that also you know kind of looks like the two school two school form. Looked at it in street view, and said, gosh, that has to have been a lo uh, Rosenwald School. Looked at the Fisk. Uh, database entry at that old photograph. This is, has to be the Rosenwald School at this location, the Sylvan School, very heavily modified, but nevertheless there. Um, and so this is kind of a, uh, using these tools, this was kind of a nice way to, uh, to access, uh, I mean, to, to, it's a way to, to be able to identify some surprises, some pleasant, present surprises. Um, and one, one other way, uh, you might have, might have wondered why I had so many different uh, aerial view years. Sometimes even a difference of a few years can tell you something. Uh, in 2010, as we see in the aerial, the uh, Orange County Training School in Chapel Hill was still standing. It was heavily, uh, heavily modified, but uh, it was still there nonetheless. And, uh, and then three years later, the, two, uh, the 2013 aerial shows that, that it's uh, been totally uh, gone uh, um, and obliterated. Uh, the address is rather long and complex, but I can give you a little slip of paper with it, and I can, uh, or we could, if you give us a card with your email, we'll email it to you. You can link to it in a, uh, um, uh, in direct, directly from an email that we send you. Um, with Andy's help, I'm going to do a little live demo. Uh, now, I think I'll need Joseph's help too for minimizing that. <laughs> yeah, that's a Uh, this is a splash screen I showed you with links to various uh, kinds of things, technical backgrounds, tutorials. But we'll just dive right in, and Andy, if Andy can click the Agree button. And there's our statewide map with our 280 or so uh, uh, places mapped. Uh, are you going to be able to scroll very easily without a mouse? mouse? Uh, we'll see. Well, you can use... Well, I, I just, just zoom in to any area just to show, uh, uh, yeah, blue into that blue dot up there on the upper left, that's the uh, Walnut Cove School. That would be a good one. Yeah, a little further, next county to the left. Just kind of zoom in. And uh, yeah, keep zooming in on it. Then maybe call up, uh, the show the uh, road view, the street view. Uh, for background, yeah, yeah, that one. 
uh, that's the, looking at the background another way, zoom in a little closer, then open up the most recent aerial. And there we start to see it from the air in its neighborhood. Click on the blue dot. And uh, let's see, let's get rid of our, and there's a photograph of it. You can click on the photograph and close that if you can. Uh, click on the National Register nomination. It opens a PDF, up the PDF of the National Register nomination. And you can close that and uh, uh, click on the Fisk entry. This is linking directly to the Fisk University database. And there's a school and a photograph, a couple of photographs of it. So um, I, actually, I, I tried this one the other day, and Street View doesn't work very well. It, doesn't, it, it actually can walk by it, but we'll, we'll try another one. Let's, let's use a search function this time. And uh, let's, uh, somebody was telling me about King Tuck School, and I didn't, wasn't sure what county it's in. Just type in C-A-N-E-T-U-C-K. Whoops, what happened? Kane. There it is. Click on that a couple times to zoom into it. This school is not on the National Register, it's on the study list, but if you click on the, uh, I think there's no street view here, you can, uh, you can try it. This is in a remote rural area, we probably are out of luck, but we can try, give it a try. In this case, we don't have uh, street view or bird's eye, it's just in a too, too remote of an area. But go back to it and click on the, uh, uh, get the ID screen. With the, we do have a photograph of it. You'll, you'll have to close that and re-click, I think. No, there, there it is. It'll be under there. There's the Fisk entry, beautiful school. And uh, then go back and click on the Fisk entry for a little more uh, detailed information about it. Uh, let's try another one with, uh, let's try Liberia. Let's just search on, uh, L I B E R I. That's uh, another uh, National Register school, this one in uh, Warren County. And again, uh, you can see a photograph. We only have photograph. We have photographs for all the National Register listings and some in other counties where we've, there have been digital photo surveys uh, lately. Um, and this time, let's try Street View here. I believe that's a state highway and we'll have better luck. There we go, we don't have bird's eye, but, uh, oh, I see we've got our little twist up there, but you can see the school up the road. This is a, uh, this version of, of Street View it gives it a fisheye kind of problem. It depends on the version of the, uh, the brow a browser that you have. And this is the first time I've seen it on an apple. But there's a school that's seen, uh, seen from the street. So those are the kinds of things. I've got one more minute. Let's do one more search. This time, let's uh, search on the word uh, down the school type. Type in one teacher. Dash. Yeah, there. Oops, there was, I think you misspelled teacher. I need a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's 23 results. Uh, a lot of them are uh, no longer standing, but uh, you can, let's look at the results and uh, just select one like Vista School, the very first one. I think that one's still standing. And then uh, uh, zoom in a little closer to it. Uh, and then click on its dot and let's see what we've, we have, it's supposed to have a picture, there it is. Simple uh, little one room school, looks like it's probably been altered. Let's look at the Fisk entry. Uh, 
that's it. Looks like it's been raised or something and altered in some way for a different use. But anyway, one, another thing you can do, like the results of that uh, one teacher entry, if you're interested in one teacher schools, you can export the results to a table you can read in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. So if, if, if a school kid was interested in doing a report on one room Rosenwald schools, here they can find a bunch of pictures, the FISC entries, uh, get a little data, create a little uh, table and uh, a little information about them. So anyway, that's it. It's great fun developing this kind of thing. It's wonderful to be able to just helicopter all over the state in a, in a couple of minutes from one place to the other and uh, see all these very different things all at the same time from the comfort of your computer room. But uh, anyway, that's, that's my uh, spiel. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Andy. This North, right, just North Carolina. States. Andy and I are with the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. Okay. And we, this, this, this data is a subset of our entire <laughs> statewide historic building survey. And we created this dedicated uh, site just for Rosenwald schools. Yeah. And, and are, do you know of any other states that are doing this level of GIS mapping uh, with uh, Rosenwald? Virtually every southern state except for the GIS. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Edmonds, and I also work at the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, Michael hired me a few years ago to help him take advantage of the industrial grade mapping software that we have. Uh, and what he's showing you today is the sort of web presence that you can create using that software. But for my presentation today, I was interested to see what options are available to those that are on a shoestring budget. Um, so let's suppose that you have a spreadsheet of information about the Rosenwald schools in your community. How do you make a map out of that? Well, today I hope to provide one solution to that question. Who remembers MapQuest? <laughs> All right, we've got you know, people my age here. So MapQuest came out in 1995, and in the late 1990s, MapQuest was the dominant website for locating an address and finding directions, driving directions. Netscape, Navi Netscape Navigator may have been your web browser, and you were probably using America Online. In 2005, Google Maps was born. Google Maps is so woven into my daily on life existence, online existence, that I have a hard time imagining it's only 10 years old. It feels like it's been around forever. Uh, and this is what it looked like when it debuted. This is what it looks like today. Google Maps has added building footprints, live traffic feeds, multiple years of street view imagery, walking and bike trails, and the ability to find directions using a bus or a subway. So online mapping is no longer just about roads and states and capitals. If a picture is worth a 1,000 words, what is a map worth? I contend that a map can be worth a 1,000 stories. There's certainly a big story behind this map about Julius Rosenwald and education and race relations in America. But there is also a story behind every single dot on that map. And there are 5,000 
295 of those stories. Stories about community and teachers and all the students who have passed through these schools. The company that makes my industrial grade mapping software also provides a free online toolkit for beginners, and it's called Story Maps. Here's the link if you want to see that. <laughs> Story Maps gives you a way to express a narrative that is grounded by geography and place. The company's name is Esri, E S R I. I'm sorry. Oh. Story Maps. ARCGIS.com. If you just Google story maps, you'll probably find it. So the company's name is Esri, E S R I, and they have developed storytelling templates that help you get started. Maybe your story is sequential in nature, or maybe you have a top 10 list. While I show you a couple of examples, I encourage you to think about your Rosenwald School's connection and the sort of story you might want to tell and how this software might facilitate that telling. So uh, this is a sequential story map. And um, uh, Joseph, would you mind hitting the link down at the bottom? In the bo yeah, right, bottom right corner. Let's see if the internets are working today for me. Uh, and this story map is about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And the story map progresses linearly through time, detailing the events that happened in Washington, D.C., leading up to his assassination. And if, uh, if you, just if you click over here, there's a, an advanced, a little advanced arrow. This takes you through from site to site in Washington on a linear, uh, chronologic um, path through the city. And you notice that it, uh, the lots of contextual photographs and text that help you understand the story a lot better than a, than a simple map would, where you would be expected to click on things yourself. So, how do you come to search on the death of Abraham? How do you come up with that? This, uh, so, the, the website, the storymaps.arcgis.com, has hundreds and hundreds of different maps that people have made that look like this or similar to this. Uh, and the the company that makes this software has a team of developers who've made some sample maps for you, to give you some ideas of what, it, uh, what a story map of your own could look like. So this is just one of their ideas for what you could do with this technology. So lots and lots of, um, so, uh, can we go back to the next one? So I'm going to uh, show you one other here. I'm down at like the seventh slide or so. Yeah. So uh, thanks. Oh, I could have done that, right? <laughs> Am I? Yeah. Would you please? Thank you. You should have been here at the beginning when we had lots of IT issues. Uh, so this is a, a different kind of uh, story map that gives you the opportunity to kind of peek into history. So can you hit the link on this one, please? Thank you. And this, uh, this is a really cool tool. Um, there is a what they call a spyglass tool. And if you, Joseph, if you grab the spyglass and move it around, um, so here you have an aerial image of New York City as it looks today. And there's a second map underneath which shows an 1836 map. And you can examine you know, the changes that have, have occurred over time. So imagine that maybe you have a 1930 map of your county that shows the locations of all the Rosenwald schools. This could be a very provocative way to engage a website visitor. Back to the next one. 
And uh, with regards to the Abraham Lincoln story map, uh, perhaps you have a story about the chronology of Rosenwald schools in your community that you want to focus on the local residents who brought these schools to fruition over time. And, and kind of conceptualize how you might apply your own story to these templates. So the benefits of using this platform, uh, first and foremost, it's free. So that's good, right? Um, now, I recognize that I have 20 years of experience as a geographer. So what I think might be simple, it may not be for everyone, but uh, with these story map templates, Esri is truly focusing on the beginner with no web development or geography skills. The template designs I find attractive, engaging. And while you, you can embed these maps into your own website, you don't necessarily even have to have a website because Esri will host it for you. Finally, these maps automatically resize very nicely to fit mobile devices. So you build it once, it works nicely on a desktop, it works on a tablet, works on a phone. And you don't have to do any other development to get that to, to work. All right, so I've mostly shown you some pretty pictures up to this point, but now we're going to have a little bit of tech talk. So there will be math. Uh, my example is predicated upon two ideas. One, that you have a list of schools, and two, that you know the addresses. Uh, but neither need be true. This example still works if you're only concerned with a single structure. And if you don't know the address, the software will allow you to add places to the map later on. So start with an Excel spreadsheet or use a free Google Sheets if you don't have Excel. And you'll want to create a different column for every discrete piece of information. For example, one column for the school name, one column for the year of construction, etc. It also works best if you have separate columns for the street address, the town, the state, and the zip code. Now you can also include columns for other things, like links to online documents or photographs. So uh, as Michael showed you with our website, uh, we have scanned all the National Register nominations of Rosenwald schools, and we make those available as PDFs online. You could link to those. You could link to an entry in the FISC database. Uh, you could link to a page of photographs that's on the Flickr website. So take advantage of the uh, resources that people have already published on the website uh, for the schools in your area. <coughs> when you're done with the Excel spreadsheet, you need to save it as a CSV file. Don't worry about it. It's just a, a file format that Esri likes more than Excel. Uh, and then you need to upload that CSV file to this intermediary space that you can think of as a holding pen on the Esri website. This pen is where you will choose uh, what data goes into your story map and how that data should be displayed. Excel will map your address list in seconds, but do take the time to ensure that they're correctly plotted at the right location. Um, if it's not, you can move points around. So if they get anything wrong, and I've, I've asked it to map all of the uh, existing Rosenwald schools uh, in North Carolina using addresses. You know, if there is an error, you can grab the, po uh, the point that they've plotted and, and move it to the correct location. So in the holding pen, you can do things like change the place marker size and color and add other contextual database, data sets like county boundaries or aerial imagery. And Esri offers a wide array of other data sets that you can choose from to add to your map. So on this one, I've decided to change all the National Register uh, schools to blue. I've added some county boundaries, or at least it's, it's listed in the map, not yet turned on. Now, uh, next thing you do is you choose the story map template that best fits your notion of how you want to tell your story. So they have about a dozen different uh, templates. And I mentioned these are sequential or comparing old versus new or a top 10 list. Figure out what story line works best with uh, the kind of information you want to convey. And I have used a few of these template tu uh, tutorials, and they are very user friendly. Uh, this is actually the fun part. It's being creative and getting to design things to look exactly the way that you want. 
When you're finished with the design, and again, the template tutorials will, will give you step-by-step -step directions of how to accomplish this, uh, you'll be given a link to your story map that sits on an Esri website. So the link can be shared in a newsletter if you don't have a website of your own. Uh, or if you do, you can embed this story map right into a website that you already run. I created a quick example that uses a template with tabs across the top uh, for different categories of schools. If you click on any one of those schools in the map, it brings up a pop-up information box, just like uh, we showed you with uh, the one that Michael did. And the information in that pop-up box is coming directly from the Excel spreadsheet that you created first. So in this one, it's hard to see, but there are, you know, I've included links to uh, the National Register nominations. So the same way that Michael was able to manipulate our website and show you uh, the nomination forms, you could do that uh, as well on a, on a free site. You don't need $15,000 software to, to make it happen. And uh, one th other thing to notice is that there's a GPS scope in the middle of the map. So you tap that, a tourist could visit these Rosenwald schools in person using this story map as a navigation tool. There are many free online mapping tools available these days that are geared toward beginners, but I really like the story map templates for their simplicity and interactiveness. And I think they, can, they help tap into an emotional connection that storytelling provides in a way that a more regular map does not. So good luck, and thank you for your time. <laughs> yes? Quick question. Uh, so if we had um, all the maps from the county and the county of like, where all our different protocol schools were, um, will we be able to overlay the older maps with the current whatever map that's, that's in there? Or would you have to link that in, in the um, spreadsheet? So the, the older map, you can certainly add to uh, the story map as a background layer, mm -hmm. just like you looked at that 1836 New York map. The one caveat is, is that it needs to be geo-referenced, right. which is just a term that means that you've taken a map that's digitized and you've, tell, you've told it what its uh, coordinates in real world space are. So that when you overlay it with like a Google map or one of these maps, that it knows where it sits in the world. But if, if it is geo-referenced, then yeah, you, just, you, just, you can just bring it right in uh, and add it as a layer uh, and use it as a base map. And is there a way of dealing with like schools, for example, where there is no street address because they're in the middle of the woods somewhere? Right, so uh, one thing I didn't do is I, I sort of made that assumption that we know the addresses for all these schools. Um, and if you have addresses for some, that's great. Have uh, this process put the points on the map for you. But uh, you can go in and uh, into that map of points and say, all right, you're missing one. Let me create a new point, a new marker at this location. And it doesn't have to have an address. It could be in the middle of the forest. That, that's perfectly fine. So yeah, there's certainly capability to do that. Did you? you Talked about what limitations. This is free. It looks almost as good as what, <laughs> as what ours is. Uh, you know, in terms of limitations, number of features, uh, search capability, this sort of thing. Sure. Uh, so on our website uh, that Michael showed you, we had a search functionality. Um, and there's nothing like that quite built into to this uh, platform. So you can't search for Russell's school across your information in a story map necessarily. So um, this is probably less, this is probably more of I have a particular story I want to impart to my viewer rather than I want them to do kind of some investigation on their own to kind of learn. Like there's definitely a storyline that you want to follow. Um, I'm not sure about like maybe the street view tool may not actually be incorporated here. Uh, it's, uh, I noticed that there is a limitation on how close you can get using the aerials. On our website, you can zoom down pretty close to maybe, you know, so you just see like a block worth of, of, of uh, 
you know, real life on the screen. Whereas on this one, you can't zoom down quite, quite as far. So there are, there are definitely some limitations, but I mean, for free, I mean, this, this is pretty impressive, I think. I've, I've, been, um, I've been very impressed with, with how um, interested the company is in providing cartography and mapping tools for the everyday user, and not just the GIS nerds like us. <laughs> Yes. So um, let's assume that you want to do this story map but of a specific single. Yes. And you want to link to maybe pictures of people that have attended the school and other things around the school. Yeah. Which may not be on the internet now. Right? So I mean in order to make the spreadsheet work with a link, it's gotta know where to look. Right. Right. So if you have you know classmates and you know 50 kids that went to the school that you would like a picture of each, you need to this um, this platform allows you to upload photographs, uh, and it'll it'll be on on their server as opposed to being available at Flickr or some other spot. But yeah, you can you certainly can do that. Yes, sir. How is North Carolina handling the schools that are not standing? If there's, uh, that, that are gone, but say perhaps there's uh, historical markers at the site. Is that being available? I mean, can you locate that on your website? Say, say there's a historical marker, so it's just not there. Well, you could map anything. I mean, you're, you're talking about mapping the, the, the location of markers. Well, I guess that would be. Yeah, you can. If there's no marker there, then I guess you get out of the material. There's no marker there. Well, I mean, we're, we're trying to map the location of every one we can get close, you know. Whether there's a marker there or not. Yeah, I mean, but if, but, well, I guess a marker, but I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. You, you mean like a highway marker? Same thing, you know, uh, a state historical marker. Okay. You, well, I, well, I know South Carolina got your state historic, historical marker, and I've seen them around. I'm just saying, if the school isn't physically there, is it still being, is the information still being uploaded somehow? Can you search on the World Wall database and say it? Uh, sure, on our, on our website. So Michael showed we've got a 250 or so places that are identified as Rosenwald schools. And there won't be no picture, I guess. Just well, some we have. So some we have. Uh, it, it's possible that uh, our office surveyed it in the 70s, took a photograph. We make that photograph available, and then it's demolished in the 90s. So you know that information about that school is still available. And other places, maybe we only learned about it because the FISC database had an entry, and we were able to use maybe some of these historic maps to say, oh, that's where that school was located. So um, we're adding to, I, I would love for us to someday have those 850 places across the state mapped. And as we get more information, we update the map. So how, what, about what percentage of the Rosenwald schools in North Carolina have been accounted for, or you confirmed their status, either extinct or demolished? Uh, we have about a third that we believe we've mapped at close. And about of the third, um, I think we have like 280 mapped out of 800 and something. And uh, of the 280 mapped, we've identified 100. 30 is gone. That's about 150 standing. Those they would they, they may have been only standing, you know, 25 years ago. And they may not so it's it's a, you know, it's a constant updating kind of process as you get more and better information. Is there some kind of a, a protocol or something in place for uh, counties or organizations to do like this work of like locating their schools? locally to get this information to the State Preservation Office? Well, we, um, our agent, Claudia Brown um, in our agency, she's head of our Survey National Register Branch, has worked closely with uh, a group called, uh, what's it called, the Rosenwald uh, Schools. Uh, so it's a, it is a statewide group, and they have uh, had several statewide meetings, and there are quite a number of volunteers who have provided this kind of and on our website, if you go to the uh, North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office website, uh, on the very first page, we have a picture of a, a link to a Rosenwald School website. You click on that, 
you'll see the list of all the volunteers and what they've identified and that sort of thing. So, but there again, it's ongoing and, and you know, and after all this work, there's still two thirds that are kind of unaccounted for. And, uh, and we hope at times, some of the information might be in local school board records, it might be old photographs and stuff. That's kind of an in-depth level of research that you're not going to just find online. So over time, it will get better. Uh, in my particular case, where I live in Kansas, Southern, we, found, uh, we found out there were four Rosenwald schools in the county. And, and this, the, this database had pictures of three of the four schools. And I, we managed to find a picture of the, of the school they didn't have. So uh, I went to the FIST website and it had a email the Rosenwald database. I want them to get the bottom line of this. I want them to get that picture. So my question to you is, have you ever dealt with this university as far as maybe in any no. capacity at all? No, I don't like that. Uh, I assume, you know, there are a number, a lot don't have pictures. Right. And I assume that's, that there's not a photo in their file for whatever reason that was lost you know, 50 years ago or no picture was never taken or whatever. Finding photographs of things that have been gone a long time is going to be really hit and miss. You know, maybe local school board. Uh, well, we, we found out that a lot of a lot of the alumni are still living and they have right. pictures. Alumni, <laughs> That's what we find you know, out. Private that would be a great way to use this database to basically create your own. Because right. this database is just the records that exist at this. Right. It's just sure the records of all the rules of all Great. Yeah. All I want to do is provide them a picture, you know, so they can put things up. I've tried to contact them. I think there's only, there used to be only one person there, so ah, very old. And that's right. Right. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of institutional support. I think all the guys young students get yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and Fisk won't share their database, I mean, you can go access it. But I, I, I'm, I'm with the Texas ship out, and I ask, can you just share the database, and they won't do that. They won't do that. So we can link to it. I mean, right. everything yeah. that's up there is free to us to, to use, no. but it's not. We can't populate our own survey with all their data without just entering it by hand. And they, all the photos they have are photos that are actually taken by their field representatives from the Rosenwald farm. farm. So I doubt that they would even accept new photos right. because it's. It's a very specific data and photo set that it's they have. It's a closed collection. It is what it is. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned earlier that on the state uh, urban what we saw, you had 250 sites. About. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. And, and I was just looking at the information. They were actually over the course of all the world, 813 schools that were built. Um, I'm sure there are not even 13 left. However, do, is, is that information there? I mean, the, the fact that you don't have a picture of it, understandable, but is it the fact that it existed at one point on that database or is that somewhere else? Uh, somebody had to know it was 813. Not yet. I mean, I'd, I'd love for us to get to that point where we have 813 dots on the map, but we're not there yet. Do you know if any states have finished their survey? To you? Mississippi no, has. So for every school that's listed for their state, they have some kind of data? We know, we know 99% where they were and where the schools is. Wow. Oh, that's pretty good. They so don't know where they were, you don't know where to look, so you don't. Right. So there's a out of how many statewide? We had 557. But, we were number two. And that's which state? Mississippi. Mississippi. We only okay. have we have terrible we have terrible um, uh, survival rate. We only have 15. Wow. It's a whole state. All right, we're at uh, 2.30, so I think we should let Joseph kick off. Thank you for your help, Joseph. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You okay, would you? There. Yeah. 
I'll have to. I will have to sit at some point because I'll have to navigate uh, some external information as well. Uh, my name is Joseph Hooper. I am a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm also a graduate certificate seeking student at, uh, at Duke University. So my, at UNC, I currently pursue uh, cultural studies and literacies. And at Duke, I'm in a program on information sciences and information studies. Um, this program, um, this project, Revisualizing Rosenwald School's Data, uh, will, was, um, came out of a project that I did at Duke University uh, in a historical and cultural uh, visualization course. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but the overview of this project, I'll give you a little bit of background about the impetus for this project, uh, as well as the process that I went through. I'm not going to be that in depth. Uh, so it'll just be the highlights. I'll talk a little bit about Tableau, which is a data visualization uh, software package. Uh, there's a desktop version, as well as something called Tableau Public, which is a public version that, you're, that you can use and access if you don't want to have to pay the big dollars for this software site. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, for the software. Then I'll take some time to answer your questions. Well, the purpose, as I said earlier, uh, of this project uh, came out of a, uh, of a project that I was doing at Duke. Uh, they just started a new program on historic preservation uh, It deals with that. And it looks at trying to take these new tools and technologies to preserve history. Uh, so given the, uh, the interest in, or my interest in uh, Rosenwald's uh, schools, uh, actually my advi one of my advisors at UNC has done a lot of work on Rosenwald schools, particularly on the uh, Rougemont community in, in Durham. So uh, given that interest, uh, I wanted to be able to tell a story using Tableau, using this data visualization uh, software that we have, because it will it branches off from the FIST database. Some of you guys have mentioned the FIST database already. Uh, I too run into a little bit of trouble trying to get that data. Uh, I did speak with multiple people. I sent a proposal off. Unfortunately, I never heard back. I think one of the biggest issues was explaining, now what's Tableau again? So, <laughs> you know, I did run into that trying to articulate well uh, what the software package is and what it can do. So I did find a way to get around uh, the database to be able to get large amounts of information quickly. Uh, because this database is not closed, I don't need a password. Uh, I wasn't stepping on any ethical toes in that, in, in, in that way. So if it were closed, I need a password, of course, I wouldn't be able to access the database, the back end of it. At any rate, so when I wanted to uh, look at this Rosenwald School data, I was approaching this from an educational perspective, is how can we get students involved, interested in learning about the Rosenwald Schools? How can we get them involved in talking about these local histories at both the high school as well as at the college level? And not just in educational forms, but also public history and public information, public education as well. So how can we get this information out? And I think that that begins as pertains to education is that we don't want students just to be consumers of information. We don't want them to just have all these facts. We want them to be able to produce. And one way that we can get them to produce these histories, to be able to reinterpret information, not just consume it. The way to recreate or reinterpret information, not just consume it, can be done through things like GIS, can be done through things like Tableau. Other, other software packages that are similar to Tableau, Palladio, which is a program out of Stanford. Uh, there's also Gephi, which is a networking visualization uh, software package. So these are tools that we can integrate into the classroom to get students working with this very rich data, to be able to articulate new narratives about the data and the information that we have, because there's tons of stories that's in that information that just needs to be extrapolated. So I think that visualization offers promise because there's narratives uh, in, that, in that data and there's a way to tell new stories. So my premise is, is that interacting with different visualization tools can influence student understanding of Rosenwald School data, which can lead to new research uh, questions related to that data. So we can look at this both quantitatively and qualitatively. We can think about this in terms of funding and money. We can also look at it qualitatively and think about what stories do these things tell and connecting this data to, or, to the rich oral histories that we have that are just waiting to be told and are continually being told. So I think that Tableau actually transforms the way that we look and, and look at and analyze uh, data. 
So obviously there's a lot of information, so I wanted to focus, because I'm here in uh, the Triangle area, I wanted to focus on schools in Durham, Orange, and Wake County, counties, and then revisualize this data using Tableau. Um, so we've all seen this site, right? If you want to go to this site, and I know that this was a very, this was a wonderful undertaking, it was a large undertaking. So and I think this is, a, this is when I, I do want to say that when I talk about Tableau in the data, I want to say it's not to replace this database, it's to be used in conjunction with this database. So I do want to make that clear. But we know when we see this database, we've got to go in, we've got to type in a name, we want to find it, current name, state, and so on and so forth. But if you want to extract that data, you have to go through a process. And we've all experienced this, where then you come over here, and if you want to get a list, you can type in Durham, and then you can see you have the Rougemont School with all this information. So really, you have a three-part process. So that can be quite difficult. So my hope was to be able to get access to this database, but as I've said, it wasn't that, it was uh, a lot more difficult. But I can understand why. I mean, this was a large undertaking. A lot of hours went in this project. Just to give over that data, that's a big request on my part. I do, on our, our parts, so I do understand that and respect that. So you can imagine that information being articulated or visualized in this presentation here where we're able to see this here at the top, this visual, we have some information down here, we have some sliders so you can slot out, and I will dem I'll demonstrate this all for a little bit later. But this is multiple and multiple pages of information from the FIST database put into one visualization component, and now we're able to compare information and begin to ask these research questions. Well, why was there more money for the Rougemont community as there were for Sylvan community, and so on and so forth. And, I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and we'll look at this and I'll talk about this uh, in more detail a little bit later. So the process with this required data mining. Are you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. So I had to go into the back end of the FIST database, and it is open. And I was able to, what you call, is mine the data. There are multiple ways that you can mine this data. One is if you're a pro, you can write a macro. So if you can write a macro, you can go in and, uh, and train your computer to be able to find this information. The problem with the Rosen, not really the problem, but the thing that the Rosenwald School database included was included these frames. So you're not able to grab as much information. It's like two or three schools at a time. I want 10 at a time, 20 at a time, 30 at a time. So the macro didn't work. Uh, another way to do this is, called, is with a program called Python. Python is, if, if you're a programmer, if you're familiar with this, you can get this information using that, but that requires extensive knowledge of that particular programming uh, language. I found a couple tools online that I used uh, that doesn't require programming. Uh, so it's called Outwit Hub and Import IO. These are fantastic software packages. I'm, has anyone ever anyone familiar with these? No. Uh, if, if you're interested in data, if you're interested in going to the FIS database, you and wanting get wanting to get large amounts of information, this is the easier way to do this. I personally found Outwit. Outwit Hub a little bit easier and more intuitive. Import IO was uh, it did have some advantages. One was it actually created a very awesome uh, uh, spreadsheet for you online at a 100 schools per spreadsheet. You could then take that information, save it as a CSV file or another file, and, and download it into or save it and then import it into Excel where you then have to kind of scrub the data because the information that you pull from the database will not be perfect. I will say that again. It will not be perfect. So if you want to get the line that says, you know, uh, two teacher school, this amount of money, uh, this location, county, so on and so forth, you'll need to make sure that information is aligned properly and corresponds to proper heading and was in the proper cells. So I'm not going to go through all that today and all the data mining that I did, but I, this, this is an undertaking uh, uh, that you guys can do using these free software packages out with Hub. And then from there, I was able to import this information into Tableau. So I was able, through that process, as I said, go from this, using all the data mining, to this. And I also wanted to, uh, so this is just one, one example. Now, I just didn't want to do something like this. I also wanted to do uh, with some mapping. Uh, the cool thing about Tableau is that it allows you to, it, 
number one, it has its own mapping system that will allow you to uh, uh, input latitude and longitude into Tableau. You're also able to take maps and overlay a map like this 1920s Durham map overlay that into Tableau and you're then be, and then you will have both this GIS component integrated with this textual information, statistical information. So this map here I came across, uh, this is a 1920s Durham map. I'll give you guys a little, you've seen this, uh, I think Mike showed it just a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a close up. So what I was able to do with this map uh, is I was able to like, here's Rougemont for example up here uh, and so like here's, um, let's see, I can't, uh, so here's uh, Bahamas. So you'll see some of these schools here. What I was able to do was geo-rectify this map and then I was able to use the WMS information and, integ and in integrate the information into Tableau. So it would actually create data points within that system that will allow me to map this into that software package. And this will make more sense. So another way to get the latitude and longitude that I dealt that I that I that I found using stuff was like like Google Earth Pro and that sort of thing. So I was able to georectify, go in, uh, overlay this map onto the streets map in Tableau and then place the Latin long in there in order to find out where these schools are located. And then from there, I was able to create this. So what you have here is, uh, this is all in Tableau where I have this map, it's geo-rectified, the latitude and longitude. And what this is, is so it's, it uses GIS, but also adds some other kind of visual components as well. So uh, for example, we can see that the land acreage in the key, based on from two to four, that these uh, circles here correspond to that land acreage and size. We're able to see a budget year. We're able to see all funding sources. So we can use these scales, and as we begin, as we use these scales and click on the budget year, this information will adjust. So it's not just reading, you're able to visualize it and see this more fully. So I'll pause there. Are there any, any questions so far? Yes. Yes, great question. I can also pull the photographs from the FIS site. And what I, go ahead, this way. Are, are they going to, I know they're very protected. They are. So is this published on the internet? I mean, do they know that that's the case? Or is that a problem? Or? I, I haven't received, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I did submit information to them, to FISC. Uh, I do cite it. Uh, I'm not using it for uh, any kind of commercial purposes. This is strictly for education, for educational purposes. So that's a little bit different under uh, under that information. So it wasn't closed. It's I'm treating it as uh, as cited information, and it's not for resale or anything like that. But that's a that is a good question. <laughs> when you extract the photographs, is it they come without a watermark on them? Watermarks uh, in this one, you can't see the watermarks will be on them on some some of them. Yeah, it's there. Uh, so I just kept it as, as that. Yeah, and one of these, and like I said, also cited, and uh, we'll continue to cite. So. Uh, because there, this here is a is a window. I was able just to kind of drag it, you know, and kind of scale it, eyeball it, if you will. No, no, it actually, it actually grabbed that information as well and uh, using Outwit Hub and Import IO. So it actually grabbed that photograph and I can create this box. This is called a dashboard and I can create this dashboard and then, and then put that photo there and kind of scale it so it's there. So, yeah. So, good question. What's the largest number of, uh, of entries that you can grab at any time? So, Good question. Uh, that can be, that's a little tricky. If you use Python, you can grab, if you write a script, for example, you can get a lot. I was able to grab around 10 to 20 at a time, uh, depending on how, how the back end is coded. So I was able to get that. Uh, import IO is really good because you can get 100. So you can think of doing 10 clicks will give you 100 entries, as opposed to three clicks gives you one entry. So. Saves a lot of time. Yes, sir. I just got to go right. Sure, it's okay. No problem. Um, this one is funding and land size. Does the database have anything concerning the title of the land? I don't think so. No. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. You have to go to the courthouse one time. Yeah. <laughs> so. are, are there any schools that you weren't able to find or to verify where they had? Exactly. Been? Like, for example, the, the Rusemont School, I wasn't, I just kind of went on some stuff, other things that I've read and kind of placed it based on what I've read in books. So it was just kind of like guesstimation. I don't know what you guys are able to find, but that was the case. Um, and also with this map, you can see I had, to, I had to cut it so I could lay it over an, an existing map, and that got a little tricky as, as well uh, at times. For me and my expertise, you guys may have been able to, to, to hone in a little bit more. Um, but um, like Rusemont, for example, was something the uh, Pearson schools, one and two, were kind of tricky. And what was interesting, they're really large schools. They had a lot, lot, a lot of land acreage. So uh, one of them, I think Pearson two, I couldn't find. but. I was able to guesstimate based on what I've read. Yeah. So, good. Okay. So, some other some other um, examples of data visualization uh, is this one here, uh, Rosenwald Fund grants. I was the question I had was, well, how much money did did uh, Julius give compared to what the community gave? And so here again, as opposed to going from site to site and click to click and getting this, getting this information, here I have a nice visual. And these are all the schools uh, in uh, the triangle area. So you can see, for example, like Auburn, uh, we can see that Rosenwald gave 1,200. There was 5,000 from everywhere else. So, and then if you look at the county training school in Chapel Hill, well, there was a large, a large amount of money there that was uh, produced by others, by, by, the, by the community other than Rosenwald who gave 1500 So you're able to tell these stories. Well, why is that? Why did that happen? What was going on? Who was involved? So using this data, we can tell stories. And like I said, from an educational perspective, we can get secondary and post-secondary students who are interested in doing histories and telling these local histories to use this data to see that and then begin to attach this quantitative data and qualitative information together that tells a richer story. So uh, I, I was particularly, I, I like this one, this was really good uh, and I was able to do this in Tableau uh, public so it wasn't this one wasn't as difficult to do, uh, but still is pretty powerful, I feel. And there's a lot of other examples. I encourage you guys to go to Tableau, uh, Tableau Public, check out the gallery, and see some of the very art. Some of them are sci very scientific and very artistic uh, approaches to visualizing this data. So there's a lot of opportunities here. So this is just putting my big toe in the water, if you will, uh, trying to really figure out what Tableau can do for the Rosenwald School's history and its rich data. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is an observation, probably a nitpick point as well, but I'm with the St. Matthew School, and every time we're going to see which state has that down as St. Matthew with an S, it's St. Matthew without an S. Oh, is it? We change that because it's incorrect, <laughs> and I keep saying that. Do you see it? Do I have, is it on there? St. Matthew's with an S? Yeah, yeah. I, if someone originally put it in that way, which is wrong. Okay. It's St. Matthew without an S. I'll be sure to change that. I followed the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. And that could change. That could change a lot in your search, right? I mean, just just imagine. I mean, that could change a lot. We're trying to find. Yes, sir. These are all fund grants. Can you break down that where various funds went to, where the expenditures went to? Uh, you could do that in other iterations of this. You certainly could. You certainly could break that down. So I just did the county budget year. And then, so you could break that down. You can create a dashboard that will allow you to use sliders and button selectors to be able to find that information and uh, compare it. So yes. And then this was a, the one that you've seen already. Uh, this one was a, was a big one. Uh, here these blocks correspond to the size of the school and the money of the school. So here you're able to visualize. Uh, you also have the all funding sources and then you can break, I broke it down into where this money came from as it was articulated in the Rosenwald School database. Um, so, and you can then begin to slide. And this is just a, this is a, uh, I feel an efficient way. A lot of work on the front end, but once you have it, just imagine your users, your learners, whether they be in, uh, 
um, in, in schools or even in some kind of public educational setting, be able to access this information and be able to, to understand and talk about it uh, as opposed to just using that one particular web uh, database and trying to click and, and grab the information. So what I'll do here, I, I can pause. I know we've been asking some questions. Uh, this, is, uh, this is all I was going to show you. I am going to go to the website and just kind of click around and show you how the information can change. So I'm going to go here, but any, any quick questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. How can, does Tableau, can you tie many records to one dot? Yes, yes, you, you can. Yes, you can. Now, uh, you might have to create a separate component for that, but you like uh, um, to be able to generate that information because that dashboard tells what Tableau do. Let me, let me demonstrate right quick and maybe that can, that can help. Thank you. So this is, here again, Tableau Public. And what I'm able to do, it seems a little, it's not wanting to, I guess it's the way the projector is, so I'll have to move this over just a hair. Uh, so what you're able to do is that these are also generate rollovers. So when you roll over, so here's Rougemont, you're able to get the school, the historic name, land, acreage, total funding. You can add to that if you want. You can, that can say whatever information that you want. Uh, here, the Wood School. Uh, here's the Russell School that we saw earlier out on St. Mary's. Uh, here in, uh, in um, going toward Hillsboro. Uh, so you can do all this. Now what you can also do is as I mentioned before, let's say you want to just look at schools, the budget year was 1922-23, uh, you're able to say, oh, well, there were just two schools uh, that were budgeted that year, and you're able to compare them um, as well uh, with the money, compare as well as what the, the land size is and how the funding sources looks like compared to this key. So here, uh, all funding sources, this seem to get a little bit more money than the Hickstown School. So this is just one way to visualize this information that's quick, that's engaging, and that can be built on. And of course, you can slide these down. So if you want to say, well, I'm going to look at all four funding sources between zero and this. Well, not a lot. Oops. Oops. So none. It's trying to connect to the server. It's a little slow, so it's a little finicky. So here we're still stuck at one. That's that year. Now if we click all, now we can see what schools have those funding sources within that range, and they'll come up here to your left. And these are all geolocated, uh, and you can do this with multiple maps. Uh, another example. is this one. So now we can say, well, let's say, well, you know, I just want to look at Durham County. So now I can compare schools just in Durham County. Well, let's say I want to just look at Orange County. We can see four of them. Uh, we can also select the budget year, and we can begin to compare. Well, wow, counties, trading schools, look at how it trumps the others. You know, and the question is, why was that? What was going on? What's happening? So this is the way to, to look at this quantitative data and then begin to dig deeper into this and ask more qualitative questions. Uh, so, and then the final one, uh, I'll just show, I know we're running low on time here.
then here, uh, you can see here, uh, I didn't have a photograph with this, but this is uh, Tableau recently updated. Someone asked a question about the photographs. So Tableau just recently updated, so now I'll have to go back and scale this, this particular photograph. But those are only the ones without the actual photo. That's just the, um, the blueprint of the school. But for some reason, Tableau wanted to resize them to their original shape. So I have to go back and change that. So, but, um, so here you can see, uh, as I said, you can begin to look at funding. Uh, you can look at Rosenwald funding compared to African American funding, compared to public funding. And as you begin to look at these ranges here, you can see that the graphic up top begins to change. And you can see what these look like. So you can also click on these. Uh, as you click on these, you also get a photograph of what those schools look like within, uh, as compares to the money that they got compared to the school that was built, and so on and so forth. So I know this has been a lot of technical uh, uh, information. I'll just... Um, So I'll just, end, I'll just end there to say that, that Tableau does offer a lot of opportunities and options. Uh, it can work together with GIS, and I think there's a lot to be, uh, that we can gain from these software packages, both on the end of, with their individual merit as well as collectively. So I'll take some questions. Yes, I think we had a question back here, Hamper. Yeah, just a quick question. I mean, I understand you did this as a project. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, good, great question. Uh, if you want these links, uh, I didn't bring a sheet of paper, but if you want these links, I can, I can show you, I can, give, I can send you the URL if you want to access them. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to do that. If you want to just have a sheet of paper and a pen, just write your name on the back here, and I'd be more than happy to send you the links, and you can access them, and you can send me some critique. Hey, this is cool. What if you added this? What if you added that? So I'd be more than happy to do that. So then we got a question here, then we'll go here. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, two things. Uh, the Tableau public is, is um, essentially does it host all the things on the Tableau public. Website. It will host them, yes. And you can create permanent links with them as well. And then the second one, is, it seems like in, in the work, like the, the, the biggest challenge is essentially is how do you mine your data and get it into an Excel sheet that export us. CBS yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so if, if somebody wanted to do that on a smaller scale, let's say for a county, mm -hmm. which is a rural county, which mm -hmm. you know maybe has yeah. many schools or something. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, if I would just fill that information manually into uh, a, an Excel sheet, that would be a good start. Absolutely, point. be a great starting point. Absolutely, uh, I, I, you know, you're spot on with that. You know, if you're going to do just a county, you know, there's 10 or 12 schools, doing it manually might work. Uh, so I would agree with that. I wouldn't fool around or mess around with outwit, but this, it, you can do that just as quickly by clicking back and forth if you want to do that. So yes, absolutely. Um, but I, I really recommend putting it in, oh, well, thank you. Uh, I really do recommend using Excel. I mean, you can use Google Sheets, but if you have Excel, I think it, it works a little bit better than, uh, than Google Spreadsheets, it, it, based on my experience. Uh, but, yeah. Yes. I actually have three questions, but they're all related. Sure. Um, one is, does the North Carolina SHPO have a plan for completing the survey of identifying, you know, where the, you know, the status of all the Rosenwald schools? And that's one. And based on your experience with what you've done, how long would it take to apply that same procedure to the entire state? And then is this something that the state would consider? Using as a strategy mm. for the entire state. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first question. Yeah, I think it's a continuing thing. I, I, mm. It's not high intensity. intensity. I think in the past couple of years, it wasn't statewide meeting, and Claudia Brown is essentially our point person uh, uh, working with folks. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the group and so on. Uh, but uh, it's going on, but it's not high intensity and a whole lot of. Based on your experience here, I mean, what, what percentage of schools 
schools have you been working with so far? You've done like 25? Yeah, just the schools in the, in the, in the uh, triangle area. So do that for the state. Uh, the undertaking would be the, the data, as you asked. Uh, and also making sure that FISC was okay with it for that component uh, as well. Um, and like I said, you know, I, I, I haven't received any pushback, but I, I, I do say for educational purposes, so it's a little bit different as it goes from my realm to their realm <laughs> and, how, and how that could be used. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity there. And I, I guess the, the you know, data can be taken one yeah. way or another. Yeah. You either do it the hard way. Or yeah. Now, way. if I did it my way, uh, the undertaking would not be. The undertaking would be more or less scrubbing it, making cleaning it up, making sure it's ready to go, uh, because there these guys would want that information. It may even have time to go in and start looking at those little fine, you know, uh, fine details. So, uh, and that those little problems can happen. That's why I say, you know, make sure you use Excel. It seems to work a little bit better when you're trying to scrub the data and make sure everything's aligned and where it should go. And um, so, uh, once I did that, it wouldn't be that difficult, to be honest with you. That would be the undertaking. And then figuring out, well, how do we want to visualize it? Yeah. And that's kind of artistic component, you know, in a way that's readable, understandable, legible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes? You know, I'm pretty sure that database was created with the National Trust grant. So it might be worthwhile to talk to the trust about mm. ways of extending it in this. That'd be great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is just a way of bringing it forward another couple steps. Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, ours, ours is manually entered, but we only have like five fields yeah. from this. We don't have the dollar amount mm -hmm. of the contribution okay. and all that. So it's done pretty much by hand. The, the thing with this is one thing I would hope to show, to, to show is like this is not a finished product. But to be able to say you work with the trust that, that can then work with FISC to say this is what we're trying to do. This is what we want to do. We want to use these tools together. And to be able to articulate that and then with some persuasion uh, could go a long way to, and to be able to expand this to, into something bigger. Good. Great. Do you guys have any follow-up comments? Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time.